Good morning and welcome back to our study on Isaiah, God of Restoration. We are in Isaiah 43, uh, 42 and 43 today. So halfway through 42 is where we're starting. Um, and we're in a lesson on the new Exodus. So let's start by reviewing our lesson from last week. Um, what was meaningful to you or what do you remember out of last two weeks ago? Our last lesson, which has now been two weeks ago. These people just don't seem to understand that God is in control and they don't need anything but God. Yeah, they, they really, um, there's a lot of these sections of Isaiah where uh, the, the audience is not doing everything right. Right. They don't really have it together. So, you know, it makes it very relatable, doesn't it? You know, they don't always understand that God is in control. And don't we relate to that sometimes? We Sometimes when things are really difficult, um, what does it mean to us that God is in control? Absolutely. What else? That God called for Cyrus for his plan. Okay, God, okay, God is going to call for Cyrus to accomplish his plan. So when God says, who did the thing, right? Okay, so we have in our two sort of sections, both of them start with a courtroom scene. Uh -huh. And both those courtroom scenes are God saying, hey, let me put a question to you. Who did it? And in the first one, the it is called up one from the east who's going to, you know, just chew through the nations and mm -hmm. conquer mm -hmm. and we know because you know we've read ahead we know our history that this is going to be cyrus he doesn't use cyrus's name yet because this material circles back around through the same subjects and gets its audience ready for messages that are going to be very strange to them the idea that a persian like conqueror is going to be God's, uh, I don't know about messenger, instrument, much better. Yes, God's instrument is weird. And so they have to get ready for this idea. And so we circle around and we don't say it all the way out to start with. But we know that's where we're headed. Cyrus as, as the messenger. What else? makes the islands fear and the earth tremble. Okay, the islands, so there is a sense of God's power making everyone fear and tremble, but there's an extra sense of the nations being very afraid. Why? They only have something to turn to. What, what thing do they turn to so, they have, so they're just stuck being afraid? Idols. Idols, right, exactly. They can only turn, you know, the, the nations are afraid, and so they say, oh, good job, buddy, way to make that idol, right? It's a sense of, like, they're encouraging themselves towards this uh, futile undertaking of making the idols. When we, so, yes, yeah, so the, the, the nations are afraid, and they are stuck just encouraging each other to make idols, but what is the big message to Israel? Their idols are useless. Yeah, so Israel is supposed to know that those idols are useless, and they're also supposed to know, do not fear, for I am with you. And that comes up again in today's reading, doesn't it? That idea that Israel can trust in the Lord because the Lord will be with them. And we saw this introduction of the concept of the servant of the Lord. And we saw that Israel was identified very clearly. The servant of the Lord was Israel in the first passage that we saw. And then in the second passage, it sort of took off in a different direction, didn't it? So we end up with this um, idea that the servant is both Israel and something more than Israel. It's both the nation with all these people, and it's somehow an individual who will also be a king. And so this would be really puzzling if we didn't have the spoiler alert, you know, the spoiler of the New Testament, right? Because in the New Testament, these passages are quoted and it said, well, this is about Jesus. And so we know that 
um, God is going to use uh, the role of the servant, both Israel and more than Israel. Jesus, who is a representative of Israel, who is uh, uh, gentle and yet a king. And so we know that we're headed there. This idea of the servant of the Lord is multi-layered. It means something a little simple, Israel, but it also means that, means that God is going to accomplish something new. And God talks about something new, something wonderful that will bring um, this new land, this paradise, this new garden of Eden. Remember we talked about that? Um, through a person who is, is God's servant. Okay, anything else uh, from the last previous lesson? Okay, well, let's get into today's. Would someone read Isaiah 42, 14 through 17? For a long time, I have kept silent. I have been quiet and held myself back. But now, like a woman in childbirth, I cry out, I gasp and pant. I will lay waste the mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn rivers into islands and dry up the pools. I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. But those who trust in idols who say to images, you are our gods, will be turned back in utter shame. Okay, thank you so much. Um, all right, so today's lesson begins on a little like partial passage that's kind of odd, isn't it? Isn't this a little, I don't know if it strikes you that way. It strikes me as a little odd. And um, who is speaking in this passage? What did you say? That's what I'm wondering. Oh, okay. Um, you're looking at the quote numbers. Right. Is it, yeah. is it, is it God? I think it is God. Yeah. Right, but it's it, yes, it is God, and it's a feature. <laughs> we'll call it a feature of these passages that they go back and forth, and you have to keep deciding who's speaking. Right? They don't always say. Sometimes they say, "says the Lord," but sometimes they don't, and we have to figure out who is talking. Okay. Yes, it is very good. I remember from my teaching days. Yes, we have to infer who is speaking. So God is speaking. And really, in all of these passages, God is our primary actor. Have you noticed how everyone else is, sometimes we talk about God and sometimes God is speaking, but every action that is really, you know, its root cause is God. God is the actor in history in these passages. Right? When something's being done, God is doing it. And what does God say in verse 14? C couple of things. What, what all does God say? Uh, he's tired of being quiet. Yeah, he's kept silent. It's been a long time, right? And I bet it felt like a long time, especially for Israel, right? Because right? they've been in exile. God is keeping silent, holding myself back. Back from what? From crying out and yelling at them. <laughs> Okay, so from berating them further, maybe, or even, you know, they're already in exile, so maybe from further punishment uh, or consequence, we could say. What else is God holding God's self back from? Destruction. Okay, destruction. He's talking about things he's going to do. Yeah, and what other, so God, God brought them into exile, and it's going to talk about that in a minute. Um, but what other thing is God going to do? What future promise is God making? Not in this passage, but in the whole thing. Turn the darkness into light. Darkness into light. Rescue, right? And so God has kept from rescue as well. There has been a period of waiting. And I think this is talking about both. And God is, the, the metaphor God uses is like what? Now, like a woman in childbirth, a woman in childbirth. Yeah, and it is. I do think it's like creation, right? This I'm is thinking, of, especially in verse sixteen. I'll turn darkness into light. 
Yes, yeah, light creation. Oh, yeah, oh, see, I see what you mean. Yeah, very good. And, and I was really struck as Mary was reading that verse 16, lead the blind by ways they have not known. That sounds like he's talking to the Jews, teaching them a new way to go. Okay. I'm sorry, I jumped ahead. You did, that's okay. <laughs> so um, when we get to 16, that word blind really jumps out yeah. at us, doesn't it? Because like, is God calling names? Like what? <laughs> it doesn't seem like the very nicest address, does it? So. Um, There's so many things in that word light. You know, if you look forward to the New Testament, talking about us walking in the light. Walking in the and light, Jesus yeah. Jesus will cleanse our sins the yeah yeah well let's talk so we're gonna we're getting there but i don't want to forget to talk about this image of god as a mother in childbirth what do you think about that image it's not the first time the bible's used there yeah god god is yeah, god, god does god. describe god's self as a mother sometimes or the psalms do yeah and, and the, the crying out and the pain of childbirth okay it's personal pain yeah. undergone for a purpose yeah because these are his chosen children and yeah so he really is like a mother right or she really is like a mother or you know we the we have lord trouble with pronouns the right lord there like the lord is like a mother yeah so there is a sense here where we have to remind ourselves that even though god is described as a father in scripture very often um, God is also a mother, and that's because God is not a man or a woman. God doesn't have a sex. There is no biological sex to God. God is both father and mother by analogy for how God relates to us, right? And sometimes that idea of that God is father can turn into that God is male. And that's just not accurate to scripture. We know that, but sometimes we need that reminder, right? Um, so God is like a parent, maybe gentle like a mother, maybe self-sacrificing. This is a painful image, isn't it? <laughs> you know, that just varies by family, doesn't it? <laughs> She, it, I don't know if you could hear that. She said the mother is usually the disciplinarian. <laughs> but I have heard other people say, well, the father is usually the disciplinarian. But, you know, families vary. And God is not just one or the other, but he is everything for us. I said he. Boy, it's so, I try not to say, I try to just say God. I have to use God, the Lord, Yahweh, but it's very ingrained in us. It's a very difficult habit to break. Okay. But that idea of God self-sacrificial, allowing that, that pain of childbirth to, to bring about something good, right? When you're in childbirth, what's the, what's the desired outcome? A child. Yeah. The kid, the kid is the good thing that comes out of, of childbirth. And so um, that idea that God is bringing something um, out of this pain, something good out of this pain. Okay. Now, verse 15, we see that God is withering the vegetations and drying things up. And I think, you know, I don't think we're undoing the garden paradise that we saw in the last passage so much as talking about the times in between right very often in these passages we see the wilderness comes before or in between it's on the journey right and we really get that in 16 which you all pointed out right i will make darkness into light and what else we have to lay this moon Rugged places, smooth, right? What does that remind us of? You're going to make a way in the wilderness, make the path straight. What's that sound like? There's something from the Messiah that talks about making the pathway smooth. Okay. But I can't remember. Something from Handel's Messiah, which is quoting something from Isaiah 40 which the New Testament, the gospel writers all quote, right? John the Baptist is described with that passage from Isaiah 40 
make make a way in the wilderness, make the rugged places, bring the, the, the hills low and the valleys up and make a path. And so the very thing that God says, do these things to make a way for God to come to you. God is also saying, I will make a way for you. I will make your path smooth. I'll make the rugged places into smooth places. I'll make darkness into light before you. So this is a this is a beautiful and good pro, uh, promise. And um, I will mention that I uh, I was at a writers conference uh, this week, and there were a lot of last weekend, and there were a lot of Christian authors, and um, one of them told me. Oh, you're teaching on, you know, he asked me, what are you teaching on right now? And so I told him and he said, oh, my, my theme verse for right now is out of that passage. Um, and it, this verse 16 was a theme verse in his life. And so I thought about that a lot and I made y'all a bonus video about it. <laughs> Just, you know, it was a, um, a really neat conversation and a neat idea and it's on the Isaiah study page but I didn't have time for it for today's lesson because I wanted to get through all these other verses <laughs> so you, you can check that out if you want to all right so and this little mini passage ends with people you know if you try and trust to idols what will it do for you nothing, nothing good yeah, end up put to shame if you if you try to trust in idols. And so we can see how all the themes in this little um, 14 through 17 have really related to last lesson's passage. Can't we see that? Um, but I didn't include it in last lessons because this is a little, it's one of those hinge passages. It's one of those that relates to the, to the prior, but also to the what's next, right? And so it relates to the next. It introduces this idea of the blind that we're going to talk about more. And it introduces um, this, you know, the, the last passage ended on a big praise section, which is very common to end on praise. And so now we begin what's next, okay? Yeah. Um, let's read. Yes, Sandy. I was going to say, I think at the end where he says, I will not forsake them is one of the main things, them or us. Yeah, and they were wondering because of this waiting period, because of this painful uh, period that God describes as childbirth, they are wondering, has God forsaken us? But hear this promise, I will not forsake you. And don't we wonder sometimes, like, is God with me in this or what? Because it's not going well. Even Jesus questioned. Even Jesus wondered, you know, what, what, what is your will? And, and that turning away on the cross um, was a real element of Jesus suffering that um, because of it, we are not forsaken. And so, you know, if, if this passage, if this verse 16 really speaks to us, I think that's as it should be, that um, God has something to say to us in this as well. Yeah. Other comments on that section? Okay, will someone read 18 through 25, please? Hear you deaf, look you blind, and see who is blind but my servant, and deaf like the messenger I sent. Who is the blind like the one committed to me, blind like the servant of the Lord? You have seen many things, but have paid no attention. Your ears are open, but you hear nothing. It pleased the Lord for the sake of his righteousness to make his law great and glorious. But this is a people plundered and looted, all of them trapped in pits or hidden away in prisons. They have come, become plundered with no one to rescue them. They have been made loot with no one to say, send them back. Which of you will listen to this or pay close attention in time to come? Who handed Jacob over to become loot and Israel to, to the plunderers? Was it not the Lord against whom we have sinned? For they would not follow his ways. 
they did not obey his laws. So he poured out on them his burning anger, the violence of war. It enveloped them in flames. Yet did they not understand? Yes. That's interesting. Mine says they paid no attention. <laughs> well, it consumed them, but they did not take it to heart. So take it to heart. Okay. okay. Yeah, I like that. Thank you. Okay, so moving back, let's, let's um, go back to verse 18, the beginning of that passage. So you'll notice that Israel is back to being identified very specifically. The servant is Israel here, right? The servant of the Lord and my servant in those two, two little parallels. Okay, but what is Israel like? Have we changed speaking? Yeah. Um, it does, this does not sound like God. Okay, but who's my in my servant? Well, and my sin. But later on it says against whom we have sinned. Yeah, we so do. It way. changes speakers in the middle of this yeah. passage. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I see. Twenty-one. Um, yeah, I think so. Oh, or it okay. could. It I'm could be 20. We can't really, I don't think it's easy to tell on 20, but yeah, definitely 21 begins speaking of the Lord in the third person. Because I was looking for quote marks. Yeah. And they, it, it appears that it would be 20. Well, those are a translator's right. so, um, insertion, you know, uh, pr but, provided by translators. Those right. ones, you know, but yeah. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I think someone has thought it through, which is helpful to us, right? And we take that um, as good information. So yeah, so I think in the in the opening a little bit, um, my servant, God is speaking, and then in twenty or twenty one, we get a switch to um, the prophet, the poet. Does he have a conversation with that prophet? Or the prophet conveys a portion, you know, something that God said and then um, further meaning preaches on it. Kind of, we might understand it as like continuing to preach the message God gives him, but in not in directly God's word, not from God's first person. Does that make sense? Okay. So, all right. So, um, so Israel is the servant. But what is Israel like? They're blind and deaf. Yeah, they're, they're not hearing and they're not seeing. Yeah, they're not. And that's not a very good um, uh, char characteristics for the servant, is it? You know, they're blind and deaf, right? But so one of the things this goes back to is an important passage in Isaiah. So I want to read to you from Isaiah six, and this is sort of a famous. We've talked. We've mentioned this passage um, before because this is Isaiah's vision in the throne room of heaven of God and the seraphim saying, holy, 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 and the train of the Lord's um, robe and the smoke fills the temple. You know, we have a, a real sense of the, um, the uh, in, intense presence of the Lord here. And then we get part of Isaiah's commissioning. And here's a, a, the, the tale of Isaiah's commissioning, beginning in verse 8. Then I heard the verse, voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Isaiah speaking, this, one's, uh, this is a first-person account from Isaiah. Here am I, send me. And he said, Go tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and return and be healed. And this is God's message about how the people are going to receive his correction. Are they going to receive it well and listen? On the subject. There's a lovely servant song that has that line in it, Here, here Am I, Send Me. Here Am I, Send Me. And it's uh, sung at uh, a lot of Micah 6 uh, services. I wish we would sing it. Yeah, this, it this idea that, you know, that Isaiah is confronted with this crazy vision. Of the, I mean, the smoke is filling the temple and the foundations are shaking. 
and he is willing to volunteer. Here am I, send me, is a, 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 a very striking element of this chapter. Yeah, absolutely. But then God follows it up with, this is how your ministry is going to go. And how is his ministry going to go? <clears throat> not going to see or hear people are not going to listen right would you say sandy i just said they're not going to hear or see or yeah they're going to be unwilling to hear or see um and they have eyes but they're not going to use them they have ears but they're not going to listen and just isaiah is dismayed and disturbed and he says how long how there's a cry of lament. It's it's a cry that we hear um, in the Psalms whenever there is a time of suffering. How long? And this is his own suffering and the suffering of the people. And God answers until they are destroyed and carried away into exile. And now God is talking again to the same people group 40 years later in exile. So they were blind then, and that's how they ended up in exile. And God says, you're still blind now. What do we, what do we really mean by blind? Understand? Yeah. Uh, lacking understanding. What else? Maybe an unwillingness to see the obvious unwillingness to see the obvious i think that's a good way to think about it yeah yeah they are not seeing god's message they may be seeing their suffering they may be seeing other things but they're not seeing god's way and so they are blind and deaf and he says you may be my servant but man are you a blind and deaf one right because um look at verse 21 it says the Lord, so here, what we're going to get right here, beginning in verse 21, is a little review of how we got here, right? This was, this is kind of the review of God's plan. Okay, the Lord was pleased for his righteousness sake, right? And remember, in our context, we see righteousness is the right action of God to accomplish God's purposes. Um, so God, so God had plans, he was pleased to make the law great and glorious, right? So this is a sense that there would be, that Israel would be a society that would show how good God's way is. They had the Torah, the instruction, the law of the Lord, and they were going to live it, and it was going to shine how good God's way was. Well, did they do that? They did not, right? I see head shaking. So it's this idea that great and glorious, but they didn't do it. And so now this is a people plundered and spoiled, hidden in caves. Right? This is a, the sort of the awful recollection of their situation in exile, right? Aren't they, aren't they living in this suffering? And now it seems like they have no one to rescue them and we get a very specific what does it say verse 24 who took them into exile who made it happen the lord right the the responsibility it didn't happen because the lord wasn't powerful enough it happened because the lord made it happen why because they sinned yes, against him. Law, they did not obey what did you say sandy i just said they sinned against him yeah, that sin, that sinning against him, that disobedience, and they're just, it's like, and then they didn't repent still. And he says, that's like, I set you on flame and fire and you didn't notice, right? So we, we hear that, that sorrow of the lack of repentance um, from God here. And so, all, you know, the people have been pronounced guilty. They've been thrown in jail. They still are not listening. And so what do we expect? You know, we expect a harsher sentence, right? We expect they might be destroyed entirely, but instead we get something completely different. Let's read verses, uh, Isaiah 43, verses one through seven, please. Okay. But, but now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. 
you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk <coughs> through the fire, you will not be burned. <clears throat> the flame will not set you ablaze, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba for your stead. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give men in exchange for you and people in exchange for your life. How far down? Seven? Seven. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. <clears throat> okay, so they didn't listen, and now what's God planning for them? Total destruction or what? What is this a, what is this a passage of? It sounds like a shepherd bringing his sheep to the lost. Finding the lost, yeah, what else? He's still going to be with them, and they have nothing to fear. Yeah, reassurance, nothing to fear. Yeah, great point. God is still going to be with them. It's these are these are beautiful promises of God's uh, protection, aren't they? Yeah. This is one of my favorite passages. Um, this idea that I have called you by name, and embedded in this section are several little subtle. Um, allusions to Moses in the Exodus story. I have called you by name. Moses in Exodus 33, 12 says to God, well, you said, I know you by name and you have found, and I have found favor with you. And he goes on to encourage God to stay with the people even after the golden calf. Um, and so that I have called you by name jumps out of us. What, why will God, you know, we, they might deserve full destruction. Why will God not do that? Why is God rescuing them instead? Verse 3. He said he would never forsake them. The promises, God's promises. Yeah. What does it say in verse 3? He's their savior. Yeah. It's like this is God's being and God's being God's character is defining God's action and so everything that's going to be done is about who God is I am Yahweh your God right the name of the Lord is in there under that Lord I am the Holy One of Israel your Savior that's why I will not let the rivers overflow you not let the flames scorch you nor have it burn you you know this this um these promises are based in god's character which is all like in the exodus that's what god said i will rescue you for i am yahweh for i am the lord um, yeah and always out of character yes go ahead in seven he created man for his glory so he's restored yeah. Right, and so was called and created for his glory, who he has formed, who he has made. This idea like of God as creator has really become specific in I'm your creator, right? I formed you, and that I formed you appears over and over in these passages. Um, that idea of for God's glory uh, is that I, the idea of when, when we glorify God, we reveal the truth about who God is. That's what glorifying God is. And they are supposed to reveal the shining truth of who God is. Also, the reason Moses gave to God for not abandoning the people after the golden calf. Do it for your glory to display the nature of your faithfulness. So we've got, you know, we've got like a review of where they are in, in, in hiding, plundered, how they got there. God let them be there because of their sin and God's dedication and God's promise of rescue. And so we return in verse eight to the role of the servant. And I think one of the things that one of the questions that we could ask ourselves about the servant job is what is the job? 
right? What does it mean to be God's servant? What are they supposed to be doing? What is the nature of God's servant? They're blind and deaf. They've got problems. What are they supposed to be doing as God's servant? Okay, um, so look at verse, how are we doing on time? Oh, we're doing so good. Um, eight through 13, will someone read that? Lead out those who have eyes but are blind, who have ears but are deaf. All the nations gather together and the people assemble. Which of them foretold this? and proclaim to us the former things. Let them bring in their witnesses to prove they are right, so that others may hear and say, it is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and, be, and believe me and understand that I am he before me, no God was born, nor will there be one after me. I, mm -hmm. even I, am the Lord. And apart, and apart from me, there is no Savior. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed. I, and not some foreign God among <laughs> you, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Yes, and from ancient days, I am he. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I am not like the strange gods. I am not a foreign god. That's that's interesting. Um, so I, <laughs> I like the way that came out to me in a new way that I hadn't noticed that before. I like that. Okay, so verse 8. Um, we're, the people are blind, but bring them out and assemble what else? Who else is going to assemble? Verse 9. <clears throat> All the nations. All the nations, right? And so they're going to be gathered together um, so that let them present their witnesses that some, you know, that they may be declared just, justified. What kind of language is this again? Courtroom. Courtroom. We're back to courtroom language, right? Um, and verse 10, what does the Lord say? that the people are we're witnesses 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 yes yeah so this is israel because it says and my servant whom i have chosen and we you know he, he's just been saying that's israel but he says israel you are my witnesses okay so that's a thing that happens in a courtroom as well right people witness now who are these witnesses supposed to convince Still in verse 10. The unbelievers. Which unbelievers? Well, the ones that were building the idols, maybe. Okay, that would be logical, right? That's what we're expecting. But but read verse 10. Who who is you? In the first word of verse 10 is you are my witnesses. So Israel is you. He's, God's talking to Israel. Mm -hmm. Now, who's supposed to know and believe? Israel. Israel. Who are they supposed to convince? Themselves. themselves. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Their first job is to convince themselves, to be and believe their own witness. And they cannot convince the night nations out there building their fruitless idols until they first convince themselves. What are they supposed to be convinced of? God goes ahead to testify about himself. What, what are they supposed to be convinced of? So that you may know and believe what? He is God. He is yeah. God. And, there, and the only. I'm your rescuer, savior, yeah. And there is, never will be, never was. Never and was, never will be, right? From eternity, right? We get this, this sense of the eternity of God in two places. There was, before me, there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. And then all the way in verse 13, from eternity, I am he. Yeah, and I am your savior, right? We get that in verse 11. There is no savior besides me, verse 12. I have declared and saved and proclaimed. And verse 13, none can deliver out of my hand, right? God's judgment will stand. God's judgment is based on God's decision, God's action, and the power is with him. 
and he is their deliverer. And the blind and the deaf are going to have to convince themselves by their witness, right? Their job is to stop being blind and deaf, to give their witness and believe themselves, um, believe themselves of God's faithfulness and God's rescue of them. More thoughts or questions on this passage? This little section? You would think if God is talking to them, they would understand. You would think. <laughs> maybe, maybe if they all got to have the vision of the throne room of heaven. I don't know. Because they, there were a lot of prophets that they didn't listen to over the many, many years. Mm -hmm. right? And maybe some of that is that there's also false prophets, but... Maybe some of it was that they wanted to go on behaving like they wanted to behave and not change their ways. And we can relate to that, right? Maybe maybe we would hear God if we didn't want to be stuck in our, our own control of our own lives, even if we're doing it badly. And they, that's where they were. Yeah. What else? Well, let's read this last section, 14 through 21. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. You notice we've seen that title several times today, a characteristic title out of uh, in Isaiah. For your sake, I have sent to Babylon. Okay, now we're getting specific. It was just one from the east, and they're going to destroy somebody, and now we get, okay, Babylon is going to get destroyed. For your sake, I have sent to Babylon, and I will bring them all down as fugitives. Even the Chaldeans, okay, Chaldeans is a synonym for Babylonians. The Chaldeans were a root people from whom Babylon uh, arose. So even the Chaldeans into the ships in which they rejoice, I am the Lord, the Holy One, the creator of Israel, your king. So we see that God is, we're getting specific. God is going to conquer Babylon. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way through the sea and a path through the mighty waters, who brings forth the chariot and horse, the army and the mighty man, they will lie down together and not rise again. They have been quenched and extinguished like a wick. Well, do not call to mind the former things or ponder things of the past. Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you even be aware of it? I will even make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. The beasts of the field will glorify me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I have given waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself will declare my praise. What is God's new rescue going to be like in verses 16 and 17? Especially. It sounds like the parting of the sea, doesn't it? It sounds like the parting of the sea. How does it sound like a parting of the sea? What are our clues? Path through the waters. Path through the waters, what else? The chariots and horses. And chariots army. and horses, an army, right? They came, they were brought forth and then struck down. Right? And so that is the that is the plot of the 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 rescue and the exodus it's right? a reverse it's a reverse of his destruction it is you know um yes yeah it's sort of you get a lot of these like the flood is the reverse of creation the um the parting of the red sea and that is kind of the 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 in action of the flood, but against God's enemies. And then the people arise out of the water and are formed anew. You know, it's, yes, all of these things do tie together. Very, very nice. Yeah. And, you know, if we were wondering if all those allusions to Moses that I thought were there were really there, well, here God is, in fact, talking about the Exodus, giving drink to my chosen people in the desert. Remember that happened several times, um, making them a pathway through the wilderness. And so we've got, it's all like the Exodus, which is the great historical rescue of the people of God. But what does God say in verse 18? Do not dwell on the past. 
Yeah. Now, the Israelites were always supposed to remember the Exodus. So what we have is a little hyperbole here, but it's like, look, remember the Exodus? You can just forget about that. I'm going to do something new. It's going to be even better, right? It's a way of speaking. God will do this rescue that will be for them now like a roadway in the wilderness, right? The recreation of the garden where the beasts of the field glorify God. Mm -hmm. And so God will tenderly care for the people that God formed, that God chose. There are about three hints in this reading that God is going to give them something new that they've never been through before. Yeah. And that's one of them. Yes. Yeah, this this idea that God is going to do something new and something more keeps appearing, doesn't it? An unknown path I'll lead you on. Yeah. yeah. The path, those paths start out dark, right? Through mm -hmm. darkness, I'll make it into light, but that means you have to go through the dark path and that God has something better at the end of it. And we see the skill of the poetry here because, yes, this is about the exile and coming back from it. But we know because there's just too many quotations from these, from these verses in the New Testament that it's also about what God will eventually do to rescue people from sin and darkness in Jesus Christ. Yeah, and so it's pointing forward. It, it, uh, um, I'm thinking about curriculum for Anna Lee. And what stories do you tell a three and a half year old? What are those basic stories from the Bible that would be such important foundations? And over and over again, the answer comes to me that the story of Moses, yeah, even on a three and a half year old understanding, is a very basic because it it just pops up everywhere in the Old Testament. The New Testament is constantly being reflected upon. Yeah, and besides creation and the flood, it's the strongest evidence of God. That of all the stories, the Exodus kind of forms a pattern that gets over and over relied on to say something about who God is. God is a rescuer. God is a deliverer. God is a God who uh, despises the abuse of people. God is a God who wants to give you a chance to turn around. And if you're really unwilling, let you drown yourself and your chariots and your horses in the sea because there are 10 plagues. Ten chances for Egypt to decide to that God really meant what God said when God proved it over and over, right? And so there's a lot of there's a lot of messages in there, yeah. But you still get to choose for yourself. That's who God is as well. Yeah, I don't know. That, that may not fall into the three and a half year old curriculum, but it falls into ours, right? Like it, I think that matters to no, us. We're just talking about yeah yeah what else what else other comments or questions from today i just noticed how many times it says i am i will i have mm -hmm. in these sections yeah god is the is the actor mm -hmm. right the uh, the idea of that god is the one doing it really comes out in that i am i will i yeah all and of that i am is present tense mm -hmm. it's always present yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not I was or I will be. I am. Or and I was and I will be. You know, <laughs> that yeah. so the name I am, right? The That's name it. is I am as I am or I will be as I will be. Um, and so it, it encompasses, you know, all of I was and I will. I was from beginning and I will be till the till it through eternity. Yeah. And it does, that nature, you know, we don't get a lot of organized, like, um, definitions of, like, God's eternal nature. We get descriptions that lead us to understand, right? From eternity, I am he. Yeah. yeah. What else? Lael or Sandy, any? Any comments you have on your mind? Okay. Well, 
I think, you know, we get this, the, this beautiful sense of, of God's rescue, God's plans for us, these beautiful promises that when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And those promises are not just for Israel, they are for us too. So that, you know, because they come out of God's nature, yes, they were for that time and place, but they come out of God's character. So they are also for us. I, you are precious in my sight. You are honored and I love you. And I think we take those words to heart because that is how God feels about God's people. And we are God's people. And like the Israelites, our first job is often to witness to ourselves, right? To review the faithfulness of God, how God has been with us, how God has rescued us, how God's promises that when we pass through the waters and the flames, God will be with us. And when we walk through the fire, we will not be scorched. And these promises matter as we go through our lives. We go through dark times. We go through difficult times. And when we witness to ourselves about how God has rescued us in the past and we apply that to our future, then it enables us to better trust God, doesn't it? God uses that to overcome our natural blindness. We naturally don't always see things the wisest way, right? But God will overcome our natural blindness and help us see God better. That's what we have Jesus for, who is, after all, the light of the world. And we can become more and more God's people, live more and more as those who glorify God, who help to reveal the truth about who God is, protector, rescuer, deliverer to ourselves and then to others, the truth that God is truly the Savior. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for your participation. Next week, we'll be in Isaiah 43:22 through 44, 23. So we have about a chapter's worth. It's just split across that chapter's division. And um, this passage has this sort of satiric take on idols. Um, it's a, a longer section on the ridiculousness of idols, and it, there are some funny pieces in it. So um, look out for that. Sometimes I need to be warned that I'm, I'm allowed to find something funny to find it. <laughs> the humor is in there. And um, we'll be back to contrasting the worthlessness of idols and the goodness and faithfulness of God. Deanna? Yeah. Did you say next week was? I got the 2322, but. 4322 through 4423, Thank you. which you can always also find on the Isaiah study page. So deannamunger.com slash Isaiah.